and we're going to go live. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Essential Patient Task Force. You have your task force panel here. Uh, we have a couple minutes until the webinar starts, so we'll go ahead and get started here in just a minute. <laughs> Excuse me. Looks like we already have uh, 42 people who are uh, logged in and it's a little bit before 11. So we'll wait to let everybody join over the next uh, few minutes before we get started. Oh, I think we're competing directly with Andrew Cuomo's COVID updates so that we're going to lose some uh, viewers just because of that. Aki, shoot. <laughs> I got a word. <laughs> that guy's funny. Yeah, it don't, totally. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I need better graphs, man. I need to have some graphs up or something. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yep. Looks like we have uh, more people joining on and just going to wait another minute or so before we get started. Been fishing at all, Scott? Uh, only a little bit. You know, there's a little uh, stream that runs close, pretty close to my house called King Creek. I take my son Jake, him and I go fishing in there. You know, it's um, you know, a hatchery supported stream, so it's not a wild trout stream by any stretch, but it's uh, literally uh, 500 yards from our house. So, you know, I've been in there more than anything, actually. That's awesome. Yeah, I used yeah, to live. All my extra time doing uh, home improvement projects. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I think that's everybody. It's a lot of extra free time. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's um, it's the top of the hour, the bottom of the hour, I guess I should say, uh, one o'clock on the East Coast, 11 o'clock here in Denver, Colorado. Um, let's give it just maybe one more minute. We'll let people continue to join and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Essential Patient Task Force webinar. I'm Christine Spraker, co-CEO of EON, and your moderator today. Thank you for taking time to join us. We're very excited to have you here with us. Today's discussion will center on caring for essential pulmonary nodule patients during the COVID-19 pandemic, and then how to safely ramp up service lines as cities and states begin to reopen. We'll also discuss the latest journal article, Management of Lung Nodules and Lung Cancer Screening During the COVID-19 Pandemic, Chest Expert Panel Report, by lead author Dr. Peter Mazzone, published online last week by RSNA. We know hospital revenues have decreased, employees have been furloughed, and essential patient care has been deferred. So what better time than now to discuss how to see patients safely and ramp oncology service lines back up? I'd like to start by introducing our new Essential Patient Task Force. We formed the Essential Patient Task Force, really an expert group of doctors, care coordinators, hospital administrators, and more to share insights and personal experience on how to care for patients while reigniting hospital workflows. Joining us on today's task force, we have Dr. Scott Skibo, a fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians He's currently practicing at Haywood Regional Medical Center outside of beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. 
We have Heather Hoyer, a radiation therapy technologist and lung cancer patient navigator at UP Health System in Marquette, Michigan. And of course, Dr. Aki Alzavedi, an interventional pulmonologist at National Jewish Health and founder and co-CEO of EON. Dr. Sebo, thanks for being here today. Uh, do you mind telling the audience a little bit about yourself and your background? Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Um, so I definitely have a keen interest in lung cancer and lung cancer outcomes. Uh, you know, in uh, Western North Carolina, I work as the Director of Interventional Thoracic Oncology as well as Chair of Lung Cancer Team. And then corporate wide for LifePoint, which is an 89 hospital, 89 hospital system. I'm the Chair of the Lung Nodule Governance Council, which is I'm interested in uh, lung cancer screening, incidental nodule management, and tying that all together in, uh, in a healthcare uh, system-wide approach to that. So thank Excellent. you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, Heather, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and yeah. your role as a lung cancer patient navigator? Yeah, and thanks for having me. Um, I have a background in radiation therapy. So I started out as a radiation therapist, um, practiced that for about six years before transitioning into the lung cancer patient navigator role that I'm currently in at UP Health System Marquette. So it's been a little over three years since I transitioned into this role. So I now get to work specifically with lung cancer patients only and have an aerial view of their care, working with the multidisciplinary teams um, to make sure that these patients are diagnosed treated and then seeing them through survivorship along with running our incidental and screening lung program. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, and then uh, Dr. Aki, do you mind telling us a little bit about you? Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Aki. I'm an interventional pulmonologist at National Jewish Health, uh, specific focus in pulmonary nodule management, and then also the uh, co-CEO of EON. And, you know, over the past, I guess, you know, five to seven years have just dedicated uh, pretty much uh, almost every aspect of my life to pulmonary nodule management and uh, uh, getting high quality programs and incidental nodules managed across the country. Uh, just have had a, a great experience over the past five years and just excited to have this discussion with Dr. Skibo and Heather today. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you again, everybody, for being here. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, COVID-19 has completely disassembled our healthcare system. COVID readiness, decreased employee hours, and deferred patient exams have left hospitals scrambling to build ramp-up strategies. Uh, this has left all of us asking an unavoidable question, what will operations look like post-COVID? Uh, Dr. Skiba, I'd like to start with you. How has COVID affected your day-to-day, -day, and can you describe how resources have been reallocated at your facilities? Well, certainly it's affected me greatly as a, a pulmonologist that deals in lung cancer and nodules. Uh, you know, our incidental nodule volume is down significantly because uh, CT scan volume is down significantly. Our lung cancer screening program is on pause as it is everywhere. Um, you know, um, as far as uh, resource allocation, we've, um, until just uh, very recently this week, have been putting a hold on any elective procedures to make sure we're saving any uh, PPE for, um, you know, for we're, we're, we're de definitely um, trying to conserve the protective equipment uh, for the hospital. Um, so it, it has absolutely affected um, our pulmonary outpatient practice that focuses on nodules and lung cancer. Absolutely. And Heather, are you seeing something similar? How has your day-to-day -day been affected? Yeah, very similar here. You know, we have a lot of reduction in volumes, um, staff having to take time off, allocating resources that way. And our screening program um, also is on pause right now. And our incidental nodule program, it is, it is still operating, but we're having substantially reduced volumes because we're seeing less incidentals coming into the hospital as well as less routine chest CTs as our, um, you know, non-essential procedures are being halted too. Absolutely. And, and for those patients that you are able to see, um, do you find that they tend to be a little scared to come in for treatment or do they feel safe coming in to have some of those procedures and exams? Um, for the most part, any patients that are under treatment right now, they feel okay. They know the precautions that we're taking for them and for ourselves. It's been a little more trickier working up these newer patients that came into the system at the height of this. Um, they are apprehensive. They're fearful. It's interesting from my navigation standpoint, I was prepared to 
combat the delay in services and uh, attack it from that end at our level with, with the healthcare system, but I was not expecting patients not wanting to come in and be worked up. So there's been a lot of barriers regarding that and a lot of thinking outside of the box to, box to navigate that and get them worked up. Absolutely. And I think, I think we're seeing that across the country as a whole, even 911 calls are down and ER visits are down and patients as a whole are just frightened to come in and, and fearful of, of um, you know, contracting COVID. Well, thank you. Uh, to set the stage a little bit, I'd like to shift gears a bit here and discuss the recent journal article management of lung nodules and lung cancer screening during the COVID-19 pandemic. As mentioned, it was published online last week in the RSNA. Aki, I know you've spent a lot of time digging into this article. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I think we shared the link in the chat, but the article really provides guidance for 12 different scenarios around lung cancer screening and pulmonary nodule management. And I think we're going to discuss maybe a couple of these today, and I would love to get the panel's perspective and your recommendations on these. Um, so scenario one, it starts by stating, an individual who meets eligibility criteria is referred to your lung cancer screening program. The consensus statement is that during the COVID pandemic, consistent with CDC guidance to defer non-urgent care, it is suggested that the initiation of screening be delayed. Um, Dr. Aki, Dr. Skiba, I'd love your thoughts. Do you agree with this? And what have you been doing in your clinics? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, rightfully so, I think everything was delayed, right? Like Dr. Skibo and Heather just stated to make sure that hospitals could handle a surge. And then also for hospitals to create standard operating procedures in which a patient who wanted to get a lung cancer screen, a baseline scan could do so safely. And so those in my mind have definitely been delayed and rightfully so. Um, and, there, and I think that this consensus statement is just stating that it's okay and what the risk is of delaying these patients a certain amount of time. Um, it, it, you know, it, there's going to be a time, I think that rollout is going to start and the baseline screening most certainly will need to happen again. My concern is, is that somebody who wanted to get a baseline scan from March or April, right, that hasn't had a lung cancer screen at all is now going to want to wait or not get that screen. It was already hard enough to get them in, right? The 4% of eligible patients to 10% of eligible patients were actually being screened anyways. And so now I'm worried, more worried about baseline scans just like not happening. So, you know, from, from scenario one to me, it's, a, it's about, um, it's okay that we delayed it, but I do think it's very, very important. And it's gonna be a, I think a repeating kind of theme that we need to make our patients feel very safe to come in and get a baseline lung cancer screen. Yeah, I would agree completely with that. The pause is appropriate. And I agree the adherence, um, you know, the data shows if you let it go out past 30 days, your adherence rate drops significantly. Um, and I think we're going to probably end up seeing that, especially because these patients are afraid. You know, a lot of them do have lung disease. Uh, you know, of course, by definition, most of them are above 60. Um, you know, so these are the patients that are at risk for serious complications from COVID. So, you know, they're going to have to feel comfortable that it is safe to come in for a scan before they will do so. And so that pause allowed us to build these protocols um, to make sure things are safe and to make sure we have a protective equipment. Um, and, and just the programs in place to allow that to happen. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point real quick, just about the PPE, is that um, if you do restart programs like lung cancer screening for baseline and then all, all these other nodules and service lines, the consumption of PPE is dramatic. It's dramatically increased to what it was over the past month. And so that's why that, that we're, I think we're all saying that the pause was appropriate because we didn't want these non-COVID service lines consuming PPE to folks that may need to have them in the ICU for those ventilated patients. So now we're saying that, okay, cool, we caught up with PPE, we understand the ICU coverage is, is, is good and we have capacity. And so now we're okay with starting these new service lines that are going to start consuming the PPE and why the pause was appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a, a good segue. As these scenarios progress through this paper, they become a little bit more complicated and, and complex about what they're actually asking. So Aki, if you can jump to scenario six. 
It Absolutely. asks, um, a patient is due for a serial uh, surveillance chest CT scan for an incidentally or screening detected part solid lung nodule with the, <clears throat> excuse me, with the solid component being six to eight millimeters in diameter. So the consensus statement is during the COVID pandemic, consistent with CDC guidance to defer non-urgent care, it is acceptable to delay the surveillance for approximately three to six months. As a panel, do you agree with this? I think so. Yeah, I would. I would um, also agree with this. You know, they're looking at the paper. You know, they had a pretty good consensus um, that only one one of the experts of the twenty four were um, neutral, and I would agree with that. You know, to delay this um, three to six months um, instead of following the three month CT scan, I think is very reasonable in this. Um, you know, which would be a lung rads four A patient. So real quick, sorry. Scenario six uh, uh, is. Uh, the six to eight millimeter in diameter where what, what, uh, Scott, so I think that this would be, uh, more like a lung rads three category for six scenario seven is that lung rads four category. Um, and both of them, they're saying delay, you can delay three to six months. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying, uh, because the current, uh, recommendation suggests surveillance CT scan at three months after the nodule was identified. So you know what, I think that we should, talk to these folks because uh, a, a six to an eight millimeter in diameter for the current recommendations would be either six or 12 per the Fleshner guidelines, correct? Right. Right, so uh, what we need to do is probably talk to this this team and state that, uh, I mean, right, Dr. Skibo, right? So and correct. if we look, so like, and, and this is, brings up a good point too, right? That between the different bodies, for recommendations, there's differences, right? So Correct. the ACCP may have a, a recommendation for six to eight millimeters that's at three months or six months, but the Fleshner guidelines in 2017 state that this type of nodule can be six months or 12 months, right? Correct. So there are consensus stating that you can wait, <laughs> you know, three to six months after the date performed is basically in line with current Fleshner guidelines, right? So most people I think follow Fleshner guidelines in which a patient who has had a six to eight millimeter nodule is already waiting six months. Would we agree? Agree, I know in our clinic, that's what we're following for the incidentally found nodules, correct? For sure, so yeah, for sure. So then for this scenario in my mind, what they're doing is, is they're giving an additional three months on top of the six that Fleshner has. And they're saying that the patient needs to be scanned six to nine months from the previous date of their exam, if they have a six to eight millimeter nodule. So that's what I got out of this particular scenario. And, and, and I agree that having a buffer for these patients where you have up to three months more after the Fleshner criteria guidelines is something that's okay for flexibility as you work through your backlog. So you're saying extending the interval timeline by three to six months is acceptable in this scenario. And, and what I'm saying is, is the three month extension matches up with Fleshner recommendations. And then the additional, if you waited six, three to six months, that gives you a three month buffer if you are following the Fleshner guidelines. So my point is, is that I don't want people to mistake this for a, uh, a six month post Fleshner guidelines, which means 12 months from the date performed. So the maximum for a six to eight millimeter nodule is nine months from the date performed per this guideline, not 12 months. And that's, that's, I just wanted to clear that part up. That, I think that that makes sense. Um, and thank you for correlating that with Fleischner because I know that that's what's usually used for incidental nodules and most likely what they were referencing here. Um, let's talk about one more scenario, if that's okay. If you scroll to 11, this is where it gets a little bit more um, complex. And if there's one that jumped out to you guys that you guys want to discuss, we certainly can. But scenario 11 states, a patient uh, presents for evaluation of an incidentally detected solid nodule greater than eight millimeters in diameter, or a lung rads category four screening detected lung nodule. You estimate the probability of malignancy to be greater than 85%. So the consensus is that during the COVID pandemic, and consistent with CDC guidance to minimize exposure to the healthcare environment, it is acceptable to avoid further diagnostic 
testing and proceed to empiric treatment decision. So surgical resection or stereotactic radiotherapy. I know internally before this call, we had some thoughts and some discussion on that. So I would love for you guys to bring that discussion here uh, for the greater group to hear. And Heather, maybe you could start with that. Yeah, this was the one that I'm not sure how I feel about this and would really need some more um, insight from more professionals about it because you know, we're always pushing to get these patients worked up. And so what I interpreted from this is that it's riskier to work them up. Let's just empirically treat them either with SBRT, which certainly is appropriate. You know, we do that over surgery, but usually we do that in the setting of we've tried for a biopsy, it was unsuccessful, or maybe their comorbidities prevent them from safely having a biopsy. So then, yeah, you do treat that empirically. Um, so where these patients maybe fall outside of that, they are eligible for this workup. They have no comorbidities that would put them at risk. You know, just skipping that and going to treatment, just in my experience, you know, I've seen a handful of nodules that were small cell. So what happens to these patients that we empirically treat and it ends up being a small cell cancer? Um, so I'm, this was the one that kind of caught me off guard. The rest of them I really agreed with, but you know, I'd really like to see some more insight on this one. Great, maybe Dr. Skibo or, or Ashley yeah. have some thoughts. Well, you know, I think the answer to this question depends on where you're at, right? So um, certainly in our uh, situation where I think um, in the whole geographic region in Western North Carolina, I heard uh, this morning we have a total of 430 cases of COVID. Um, I would feel much better about doing an EBUS bronchoscopy at the very least on this patient if I send them for stereotactic radio surgery. Now in New York City or Detroit, uh, maybe the answer is it, it just sent right to surgery. And I think that's going to depend on um, local risk factors, um, the avail ability of rapid testing, you know, on the patient, the, abil uh, the availability of uh, appropriate protective gear and the resources you need um, to um, you know, to do these procedures on people. Um, but certainly, you know, surgical referral, even in, um, you know, this is going to vary by region too, not only by COVID uh, penetrance, but a lot of surgeons, um, you know, are requesting EBUS bronchoscopy prior to uh, referral, even though they're going to do a lymphadenectomy as part of their VATS procedure. Um, so um, again, that all depends um, where you're at, um, the medical culture before this um, pandemic, as well as what the pandemic's like locally. Let me ask you guys a question. So like in, in our practice, uh, I mean, let's say you had like a, you know, 1.5 centimeter spiculated lesion in the right upper lobe that's growing. And, um, you know, the patient is a, uh, you know, 40 pack year smoker with a lot of risk factors. And so your pretest probability is extremely high, right? And right now what we've done over the past, you know, month where um, we weren't able to, you know, it was, you know, difficult to get anything done, right? So what we've done is we sent those for surgical consultation, right? And, and I think that, you know, the surgeons, Dr. Skibo, have some guidance too with like who they would, you know, operate on without having a diagnosis now. And, and so maybe we can just talk to, uh, and it, like, like, like Dr. Skibo said too, this was created probably two, three weeks ago where the environment across the United States was vastly different than it is even today with service lines starting to open up and the ability to do diagnostic testing on a high pretest probability is far greater now than it was, you know, two weeks ago outside of New York, Detroit and a few other pockets in the country, which is what I think your point is, Dr. Skibo, correct? That is correct. Yeah. So like to me, it's, it's, it's about, it's about like, what do you have available at your facility in terms of the diagnostic workup? Do you have PET scan? I mean, because a PET scan would increase the post-test probability, right? And most people can do that. And EBUS bronchoscopy, if you have that service, would definitively get you whether or not this patient is a surgical candidate versus needs to go and get some, you know, uh, uh, other types of treatment, right? So um, in terms of this, I think that if you have the ability to do a diagnostic workup, you do what your normal workflow is, right, Dr. Skibo and Heather? That is correct. You know, I mean, dating back all the way to the general thoracic surgery in 2014, you get that same 15 millimeter nodule carry about a 10% positivity rate in the mediastinum, even with normal imaging. So, yeah, I think that's why the community standard has certainly been, if in question, do an EBUS as long as we can do. It. And then in the last month, as long as we can do it safely, which until 
you know, really the last couple of weeks, um, you know, we haven't really been able to do that except for in really emergent cases um, when there was a significant compromise to the patient have we been doing bronchoscopy. And pre-COVID, you know, there are a certain, you know, number of patients in which we do not have actual tissue acquisition, and it's a clinical diagnosis that's made prior to treatment. And so this just is expanding out that, that, that probability uh, uh, in terms of, you know, hey, this is 95% lung cancer, but we don't have an ability to get a tissue here, or we've tried and we weren't able to successfully. And the patient goes on being treated presumptively like they have lung cancer. And so this just allows for some flexibility in certain areas where you don't have that diagnostic capability and that you just make a presumptive diagnosis of lung cancer clinically. That's what this scenario to me is allowing some flexibility in those areas. And I think also, um, you know, not only just in this patient, that's 85%, right? But even in the, uh, the patient that's 50%, 65%, you know, the emerging field of biologics, proteomic testing, uh, immune response to these nodules, especially in the rural patient that may be going from a low incidence of COVID in their community, you're asking them to drive to, like in my uh, state, you know, Charlotte, there's a much higher rate of COVID there, or Raleigh-Durham, much higher rate of COVID there. You know, you're asking them to go from a relatively safe area to an unsafe area. So, Using other modalities to hedge our bets, I think is, um, I think is becoming more of a um, a need and and something that requires more thought as we build these programs of how we're risk stratifying our patients. I think Dr. Skibo, you really hit it when you said it. You know, it depends on by patient area. You know, I'm in Michigan, and Michigan was one of the harder states to be hit right away. But I'm in the Upper Peninsula, and we really um, haven't seen. The surge of patients. Um, we have a very low volume, luckily, so far. So even though we have been deferring care in terms of lung cancer care, we've slowly been still able to get mediastinoscopies. Um, I have a low back to me scheduled for next Tuesday. So, but we're able to do that because, you know, our administrators are weighing these risks. And um, so I don't really think that a statement like that is a one size fits all. So Heather, I think that that's a, a, a great transition to some of our next questions. And it's really about who is most at risk now? Is it people at risk of um, potentially um, getting COVID by coming into the hospital or the patients who are being delayed and waited? So what patients can wait to be seen? Which ones can't? And how are you prioritizing those patients? For, for example, your patient who's having the lobectomy next week, how are you able to prioritize them and, and still wait and defer on others? Well, in terms of, you know, the patient up for lobectomy next week, our surgeons were, we early on went off of the ACOS guidelines for triaging elective lung cancer cases. Um, those are really great guidelines if you're familiar with it. And if the patient meets those guidelines, they our surgeons championed the physician team responsible for making these decisions right now. And we were able to get that pushed through within a couple of weeks. Um, as for all the other, you know, what we consider essential patients, you know, working with Eon and the essential patient um, spreadsheet that I get every week really has helped me to triage these patients. And um, I'm a big fan of triaging lately and just prioritizing which patients are felt to have a likelihood of developing a malignancy or already having a malignancy and if they have known malignancies um, doing our best to get them through the system with the teamwork of many physicians it's never a singular person's decision um, we have we're backed by quite a few physicians that are having conversations about these patients and making these decisions so thank you and, and Dr. Skiba what about you what's your strategy for beginning to see patients um, well, you know, increased telehealth, a lot of phone visits, um, uh, certainly as the, uh, we've been had access to increased protective gear. Um, and then that allows us to open up the bronchoscopy suite as well, rapid testing uh, for patients. And um, we've incorporated that into like tomorrow doing bronchoscopy. Our patients are getting uh, tested prior to bronchoscopy, for instance. Um, so, you know, all those things I think are incorporated into um, starting to slowly ramp up our program once again. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to go back to regarding the, um, 
the paper that we discussed um, is um, patient 12, though. You know, I think the early stage lung cancer patient, I think, in my opinion, I was pretty surprised to see in the paper that 100 percent of them either agree or strongly agree that, hey, it's no big deal to delay um, therapy for stage one, confirmed stage one non-small cell lung carcinoma. Um, now, if you look at the guidelines from the American College of Surgery, they put out a position paper saying, hey, well, you know, it all depends. You know, there's three phases of, of where you're at with COVID in your community. There's a preparation phase where, hey, there's plenty of resources. You're just building up for it. You're getting ready for it. There's the urgent phase, which, you know, um, you know, you're just about at capacity. Then there's the, you know, the third phase, which is all resources are being used to take care of COVID patients. So as long as you're in the preparation phase, which in Western North Carolina, that's where we're at the preparation phase, they would say that thoracic surgery should not be delayed in any patient that may be negatively impacted by delaying their surgery for three months. So they would include in that in their guidelines, uh, lung cancer patients that are node negative, early stage, presumed lung cancer of less than two centimeters, node positive lung cancer, and then staging uh, to start uh, that's required to start treatment. So the, you know, so they differ kind of in um, compared to Mazone's paper as far as their thoughts on delaying therapy. And I think that's reasonable because if you look at the staging guidelines, the AJCC eighth edition guidelines that came out in 2018, included in that was 1A1, 1A2, and 1A3, right? If you look at the five-year survival on that, it's 91%, 84%, and 79%. So the in 1A1 is less than a centimeter, 1A2 is one to two centimeters, 1A3 is two to three centimeters, right? So um, the bigger the nodule gets, the more your survival decreases. And that's probably micrometastatic disease. Who knows? That's only my assumption based on that. But nonetheless, I think a delay allows something uh, three months, I think is probably long enough for a, a nodule to go from 0.9 centimeters to 1.3 centimeters, for instance, which brings you into the 1A2 category. So. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and some studies even suggest that patients with a stage two lung cancer diagnosis waiting longer than two months have an increased incidence of upstaging as well as a de decreased survival compared to those waiting less than a month. So exactly like, to yeah. your point. That's how I use that article from Mazone is that like, uh, you know, you, you basically can take s scenario 12 and work backwards in terms of you, you put your patients into the different scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're in scenario one, you tri you're triaging your nodule population and your lung cancer screening program as you restart. That's how I'm looking at it, right? So every patient is going to be either scenario one, two, all the way to 12. And you, you make sure that 12 is taken care of first, 11 next, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, all the way down until you work through your backlog and then you have guardrails in terms of the amount of time uh, to get those patients in for each scenario. That's how I look at that article and what they're telling us or, or their guidance and what they're trying to tell us to do. Um, mm -hmm. That's how I've been using it, Scott. And Excellent. So I think, you know, Heather brought up a great point about the essential patient report um, early in March when resources were being diverted. Uh, Eon created essential patient reports for all of our clients where we were able to segment patients by tier one patients who needed to be seen in the next seven days, tier two, next 14 days, and essential patients who needed to be seen in the next 30 days were tier three. And we provided those to our um, clients so that they could triage the lower risk, put them into a queue to be seen later, and then hopefully be able to see those higher risk patients. From that, uh, uh, something called Safety Net uh, really was created. It's a mobile um, app that identifies patients with pulmonary nodules as well as um, your lung cancer screening patients with nodules and then just triages them and segments them by risk. It also has a mobile nodule board that you're able to push those patients to. So if you're um, physician champion or you are the physician champion and you're reallocated to you know, um, the ICU for COVID, you could touch in, uh, check in and, and touch base about those patients in a mobile fashion. And so, um, this is something that we're offering across the country at, and we're donating it to every hospital. Uh, Dr. Skibo and Heather's hospital is actually getting it uh, next week. Um, I wanted to know from your guys' perspective if that, it sounds like something that's going to bring value to you and the ability to have it in a mobile setting. I think for me, um, I'm excited for it because one of the major things that have changed, we're not necessarily having our in-person 
multidisciplinary tumor bores or nodule clinics, that's been on pause. We are starting next week with a virtual model, but I've been having to just individually go to each of my providers to kind of do have these discussions offline. So to be able to, you know, have something to bring with me and really have these um, conversations with the people that they need to be had with on the go, I think is going to be great. Excellent. We're looking forward to that. Aki, do you want to add anything about safety net or should we go ahead and jump into the Q's at Q&A? Yeah, I mean, listen, like safety net for me, like what I've seen is, is that across every site, there's a backlog of patients and, you know, I'm excited to just see all these patients move off the backlog and start to get treated sooner than later. So any type of tool that helps uh, folks do that in an organized manner, like is helpful. And I'm excited about, about that. Absolutely. Well, we um, have some time left. A bunch of questions came in from folks who registered for the webinar today. Uh, if it's okay with the panel, I'd like to go ahead and read those questions to you. And then if you guys wouldn't mind answering. Also, for those of you uh, on the webinar, you can uh, chat. You can send your question through the chat or through the Q&A. It's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just enter it into uh, the chat or the Q&A, and then we'll answer those live as we go as well. So uh, I'm putting articles there too now, just so everybody knows. I've been posting all the articles that we're talking about in real time. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, the first question comes from Matt Abudara, a physician at St. Luke's Health System. He asks, what are your thoughts on dealing with the financial constraints that hospitals are facing as a result of COVID? Many do not want to invest in new resources because of a de decrease in revenue. Um, and how do we combat this and offer the best solutions? I mean, I, go ahead, Scott. Go ahead, well, I was just going to say, I guess I'm not in a position to talk about financial resources per se of the hospital, I, other than I know better not to, than I shouldn't ask for any equipment right now, right? Um, but, um, you know, I think there is going to be a, there's this backlog of patients, and I think it's how we ramp up to see these backlog of patients and being creative of seeing these patients as these, um, you know, there's this article uh, published by, or, or the commentary uh, by Rose Wagner and Health Executive you know, saying that, hey, we need to get creative at seeing these patients because a lot of these patients are going to go back to work. They can't take off of work, right, when they get back to work. And so off hours, she suggested, you know, is un unfun as it is to say, you know, Saturday visits, things like that, to try to get through our backlog and making sure we're taking care of patients and ramp back up and build our programs back up. So that's it, Aki. I'll let you answer the financial questions. Yeah, you know, I think that um, we did a financial study where we looked at what the impact was and is going to be with all of these service lines that are being deferred or delayed, right? And so um, I think, you know, Mayo had uh, some report where like up to $900 million was lost in one month. And so if you look at it across the board, I think there's 30 to 40% of their top line revenue for hospitals that they're anticipating is decreased for this year and the impact could be more than just one year. And so that's when we started screaming about four weeks ago, get your hospitals ready to ramp up service lines safely, right? Like nobody was saying, open it back up and expose people, protect your staff, protect you know the patients. This is what we're, hospitals were built to do, right? Because people come into hospitals with infectious diseases all the time. It is what it is, right? Now, not on the scale of COVID, I don't think we've seen, I've never seen it, right, Scott? I mean, have you, Heather, I don't think, you know, we haven't seen anything like that. And so we paused. And the reason we paused in my mind was to create safe standard operating procedures that we could then ramp up and start to recoup, not just clinically, but also from a financial standpoint. Rightfully so, I think that forever going forward, buying, purchasing, technology, devices, the way everything is going to happen financially in hospitals is going to be different. I think that the mechanism in which they acquire technology is going to have decreased risk on the hospital side, where, you know, risk is going to be something where, hey, listen, if there is this potential revenue that's going to be added or new revenue stream to the hospital, then the technology vendor or the device vendor is going to participate in whatever value they create instead of the risk being on hospitals up front. So I see a paradigm shifting long-term in how hospitals acquire technology and devices 
that's that that should happen. I think the smarter hospitals are going to do that. And then I think that um, you know spending is going to be way more. I think just you know uh, put through a different process where value has to be proved and defined, and certainty has to be around value. And it's just going to be difficult, I think, for uh, some hospitals to offer certain, uh, you know, services that they did in the past uh, going forward. So, I mean, like, and to Matt, I would say that, you know, make sure that what you ask for actually brings value and, and that you're able to, to, to state what that value is and then create a, a, a situation with the vendor where there's shared risk or no risk to the hospital upfront. And then that's how you are able to acquire new technology within the, 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 the current financial constraints. I don't think they're buying anything personally right now. That's not, that's not termed essential, right? Whether it's COVID essential or essential patient care, if you're not adding true value, remember Scott, like four years ago, sorry to go in about financials, but we had this webinar where I went nuts about how we spend the most in America but yet we are like 78th in terms of outcomes. And I was like, the market's gonna fall out, right? Well, look what happened. COVID has really created the market in the hospital to fall out, right? The bottom fell out. And so as a company, right, we have to look at different mechanisms and how we get the technology in and prove the value, both clinically and from a financial standpoint. And if vendors and if in industry and technology companies don't do that, I think they're going to go broke. And in the interim, hospitals need to look at new revenue streams and how to ramp them up fast, or a lot of hospitals aren't going to make it to July. So Patient good... care. Sorry, I could go on forever about financial <laughs> stuff, right? But like hospitals were made for patient care and they need to be able to afford to offer patient care. So like to me, the financial discussion is one of the most important discussions going forward about how and what we use to supplement in terms of technology and devices to do different aspects in healthcare. So that leads right into Cindy Landon. She's a, a lead nurse navigator at Henry Ford Health System. She's asking, um, and, and maybe Heather for you, do you have any suggestions for managing the backlog of patients we have as hospitals begin to um, have slow or soft ramp ups back up to full efficiency. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, triaging these patients, I'm using the essential patient web um, spreadsheet that I get weekly that breaks down these patients into three tiers with the most attention going to the first tier. So, you know, as we approach our backlog, what I'm planning to do is really pay attention to those tiers and get that communication out by tier, but also in phases, um, because if we just release all the orders at once, we're going to flood our central scheduling. We won't, we might not be able to guarantee in what order things are being scheduled. So I'm going to take a very strategic plan approach with phases by tiers, according to ranking patients by, you know, who's more essential and using that triage yeah. system. Thank you. I totally agree, Heather. And um, Cindy, I dropped an article. It's a guest commentary that Dr. Skibo referenced from Rose Wagner. She talks about capacity planning as well and adding to um, extra exams every day as your capacity planning, looking at 2019 numbers to 2020. So there might be some useful information in there in addition to uh, how Heather's uh, approaching this as well. Yeah. And Christine, like, you know, that, to, to Heather's point, like you wouldn't put like, if you want to use a different analog, right? Like Dr. Schneider uh, uh, stated that you wouldn't group a routine ultrasound for a pregnancy with like a high risk OB patient, right? Like you, like there's a difference between a routine ultrasound and a high risk OB, right? So like you, what, what, what Heather is stating is, is that, man, you got to know like who your high risk OB patients are and get those in before your routine ultrasounds. And you just apply that same analog to pulmonary nodules. And that's what that's what I think most of us are doing. Yep. Excellent. And she said, got it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Jeff uh, Amwenga um, out of Florida. He says, we're in the initial stages of implementing a community LCS program, just moved into a, newly, a new building and purchased a CT machine just before COVID-19. 
How can we navigate through such circumstances to attract patients who are scared to come in? Yeah, make them comfortable. Market, market your SOPs, right? I mean, Scott, you, you have to open up your, your services and your clinic. Like, how are you, you know, like, how are you going to make patients feel comfortable to come to see you in the office? But, right. So, you know, for instance, in the office, we no longer utilize our waiting room. You know, we room a patient right when we get them into the door and we leave them in the room. There's no, uh, there's not eight patients, you know, sitting in a waiting room and family members, family members don't come in anymore. So it's a matter of that, um, you know, chairs in a radiology waiting room, you know, six feet apart, you know, so you're doing less and more spacing and uh, efficiency with the schedule uh, per se, but um, it's making people feel safe. Um, um, because at some point the benefit from the screening is going to once again, outweigh the psychological risk to, that these patients feel of going in for the screening. And, um, you know, and I think, um, that, that time is coming, but it, it, I agree, Aki, it's, um, all about feeling comfortable and getting the service performed. Absolutely. So like, like to answer the question directly is, is that create a standard operating procedure, which truly makes it safe for patients to come in and not be exposed and staff to not be exposed to COVID. That's number one. Number two is, is market the heck out of it. Like that's a competitive advantage now. It is right. So Dr. Skibo's office can market what his SOPs are and that, Hey, listen, like we have SOPs that don't allow family members to come in that there's no waiting room. You're not going to be stuck in a waiting room for 30 minutes or an hour. Here's our process. And that would make me feel more comfortable as a patient to go see Dr. Skibo as opposed to somebody else where I'm going to be stuck in a waiting room with a mask. I don't want that. Right. So they're like to, to, to make people feel comfortable, you got to market what your SOPs are in our mind. All right, next question is from Lori Chopin, uh, lung screening program coordinator at St. Tammany Health in, in uh, Louisiana. Hi, Lori. She asked, what do you think the most effective communication method is for care coordinators to inform physicians that follow-up care is needed for essential patients? It's a great question. Yeah, for me, I'm a big advocate of just picking up the phone. Um, you know, we are in a smaller community and I have a great um, relationship with all of our local providers. So I feel very comfortable in doing that, picking up the phone, speaking to them directly, speaking to their nurse, depending on if they're readily available or not. Um, and, and that works well. We do have a backup system in place where letters are generated and sent. Um, but I find the best outcome is when I just pick up the phone and talk directly to them. Are you are people, able to get them on the phone? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Can you get them on the phone? Um, Maybe 10% of the time I'm able to actually talk to the provider directly, but I talk to a lot of their nurses. So, um, you know, I've been in this position for over three years and we are a smaller community. So it might be a little bit easier for me to form these relationships, but, you know, I'm at the point now in this position where when I call the offices, they know who's calling and they know typically why I'm calling. I'm only calling because, you know, you might probably have a lung cancer patient. Um, so it's become easy for me, but starting out, um, you know, I've always kind of really been comfortable being in uncomfortable positions. It can be a little nerve wracking, um, asking things of providers. And initially I always took the approach of, you know, these are your patients, you know, your patients best. These are our recommendations. And I've never met any provider that wasn't grateful for the extra layer of throughput in their patient care. That's a testament to you and what you've done in your program. Um, that's really great. Dr. Skibo or Aki, as a physician, do you like being communicated that way? Yeah, well, for me, you know, it's um, Amanda, my, uh, our navigator just puts it right on my schedule. So I don't, uh, she doesn't even have to communicate with me. But with the other providers, what she's found over time is she uses the phone less and less as they become very familiar with the workflow. So electronic communication, both there and back, um, is almost always what's done. So early on in the process, she's using the telephone a lot, um, less so now talking to her about kind of her process. Um, so, but I don't think any physician really minds getting a, a valuable phone call from anybody. That's for sure. Um, regarding patient management. I certainly don't. Yeah. yeah I one think of it, our barriers is we don't have, um, widespread EMRs to message through. So, you know, it's, our options are limited to a letter or a phone call. I mean, 
we can try email, but most providers. Um, so I know some of these offices that are, are not on our EMR, Amanda is using fax and that, that seems to work. Um, yeah. Even those offices are getting right back to us with, um, you know, confirmation that they heard it in, in um, agreement with plan. So the next three questions, they come from Dr. Ali Musani. He's the director of IP at University of Colorado Hospital here in Denver, also Aki's mentor. So um, I'll read them. And then Aki, maybe you want to take a shot at them. What is the role of telehealth in screening, follow-up, and surveillance of lung cancer patients? Maybe we'll pause there and let you answer, and then I'll go into the other two. Yeah, I mean, we could have a separate webinar on telehealth, right? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, so I think that there's certain, there's certain facilities around the country in which telehealth has stood up and it's established for certain types of patient. Our, 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 like lung cancer screening, right? When it comes to lung rads one, twos, and threes, are those patients primed for telehealth type visits? Absolutely, right? In my mind. Now, you know, when you start to get into the more complex patients where you actually have to have a decision where you're talking to that patient about a surgery or a potential like choices between diagnostic strategy, right? Uh, you know, interval follow-up versus tissue acquisition. Like now, normally we say, hey, this goes to a nodule board, but quite frankly, you know, I, I think that there's value in face-to-face -face and being analog with a certain patient population still, right? And so what I'm gonna tell you is, is that I do think that telehealth can be expanded out to incidental nodule patients and to lung cancer screening patients, but there is a subsection of those patients in which I think analog face-to-face, physician-to-patient interaction or provider-to-patient interaction is important. So, you know, I think it's just gonna be dependent on what your facility and your institution has in terms of telehealth capabilities. And then you need to figure out a good workflow for which patients are acceptable or you know relevant for a telehealth visit versus an analog visit? Yeah, and I would add that I think one of the lasting benefits of this uh, COVID crisis is going to be the ramp up of telehealth to do things like that. And I think it'll allow us to expand our lung cancer screening programs, for instance, into a more and more rural setting um, and uh, still be able to communicate with these patients effectively. Um, so I think that's, you know, going to be definitely one of the lasting benefits of, of this crisis is, is telehealth implementation across most healthcare systems. Absolutely. And that, that actually was part of his next question, um, basically was alluding to the fact that seeing more patients via telehealth will allow you to have more time to do necessary procedures and, and potentially patient care. Um, so, and then his final question uh, was about um, should lung cancer diagnosis and staging be delayed for a few weeks or months if bronchoscopy or surgery is required? I think we've talked about that quite a bit today. These questions came in before um, the, the chest panel uh, report came out. So I think we'll, we'll skip over that though for now and maybe move to a couple more. And can I just, anybody... can I, sorry, sorry, Christine. So like, listen, there's patients who need, there's lung cancer patients who need diagnosis now, right? So like, we don't know who they are, right? Like, but so like the whole, the whole point is, is that here's a thousand patients. There's a certain number of patients within that thousand that have lung cancer now. Those patients need diagnosis now. We need to do our best, our best to our best ability to take the group that has cancer. Let's say 200, like let's say 100 of those have cancer, which is high, right? But let's say 100 of those have cancer. We need to find the group of 150 where 99 or 100 of them are in that group of 150. And that's the 150 that we target first. That's it. And how do you find those patients, Dr. Aki? I mean, there's, listen, right? Like, like some of us, right, use pretest probability. Others of us use different likelihood ratios or interval monitoring where there's growth. Growth is probably the biggest, you know, if you look at the risk factors for what's cancer and what's not, right? Growth from exam to exam, right? There's other characteristics in which a lot of us, you know, utilize to determine whether a patient is likely to have cancer versus not, right? So, you need to do some sort of risk segmentation of all your pulmonary nodules. Size is a risk factor. Growth is a risk factor. And segment them. It doesn't matter which calculator you use. If you use a calculator or not, just segment them and get the high-risk patients in sooner. Because those are the patients who likely have cancer now that need a diagnosis today as opposed from three months from now. 
Okay, so this is a tricky question then. So Matthew Puck, a physician at Virtua asks, if you have a new cancer patient who is asymptomatic for COVID but gets a PCR test for COVID before starting treatment and it's positive, should you postpone treatment and wait until the COVID test is negative? Well, as a non-oncologist, right? So as a pulmonologist, I'm thinking about this as far as delaying procedures. Um, certainly a PCR negative is nice prior to procedures, especially in the elective setting. Yeah, there was an article in JAMA this um, uh, on the 13th talking about oncology and they split it into four different groups. And there's some patients that they say, hey, it's not appropriate to wait. Um, we don't know what to do with these people that are asymptomatic and, and, and maybe had uh, COVID a month ago and are still shedding, right? I mean, what does that mean? It's certainly nice to see the IgG be positive on the antibody test. But things like in the lung cancer realm, the example they use is small cell. I mean, it's detrimental to these patients to delay chemotherapy. You know, in stage one would be small, you know, indolent cancers, right? That, all right, maybe the incremental benefit of starting two weeks or three weeks earlier is not that much. So those patients can wait. Um, but I think that's a complicated question as a non-oncologist, you know, that's probably not a fair one for me to even try to answer. But um, nonetheless, um, you know, I think it's complicated. I think some of the conversations, you know, in the oncology world where I am is, are there a certain number of patients that can avoid surgery by starting with adjuvant chemotherapy? Um, kind of having those discussions too. So looking at different options than what they typically would go straight to in their, in their treatment algorithm. Having the discussions. Absolutely. Um, I have one more question and Heather, I'll, I'll point this to you. And then if anybody else in the audience has anything they would like to ask, please drop it in. Um, but Heather, do you, this comes from Jerry Hatley, Director of Radiology at Valley Regional Medical Center. Do you have any suggestions as we start our patient navigation program and low dose lung screening program? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think first and foremost, find a champion, um, find someone who's passionate. If that person has to be yourself, um, be that person, go out there and get it. It's always helpful to have executive or physician led champions on your side too, but getting out in the community, talking to your providers, talking to your community, um, building that education about the program up. And then in terms of the logistics of managing your program, I think it's really important, you know, based on your patient volume, having a dedicated position to manage the program, and then also having software to manage that program. Um, if I could change one thing, starting out ours, we would have had software right out of the gate. Um, it really has been a game changer, you know, using the Eon software for patient management. Any, anything you would want to add to that, Dr. Skibo? Well, I agree with everything that Heather said, and she's certainly an expert on starting a program and what's required, I mean, for sure. Right now, it's just, it's a difficult time that has some special circumstances um, to these programs. And I think echoing back to what Aki was saying um, uh, about making patients feel safe, if this is the time you're starting the program, well, it's all about starting in this environment. And, um, you know, if you're given lemons, you make some lemonade, right? And so, um, it, but I think the, the principles of program development all remain the same. It's just slightly different um, now. And hopefully this won't go on forever. Uh, but I think it's here with us for the foreseeable future. That is for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I want to thank everybody um, for joining us on this webinar today. And thank you to our panel, Dr. Skibo, Heather, Dr. Aki. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to everybody who submitted questions. If you think of something afterwards, please feel free to send it our way. Um, you can find us um, online uh, where you registered for uh, the webinar at. And then uh, just again, thank you for joining us and stay healthy during uh, this time. Appreciate everything that everyone's doing. Thank you. Thanks All for right. having us. Thanks, Christine. Appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.